The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. If there is a blank canvas in front of me, I cannot leave it blank. I have to draw on it. I have to do something with it. And that, you know, I think that's where my artwork really started to grow. I would sit there and start drawing napkins and these different people would actually pay me for them. Like I'd pay for my meals just by drawing on napkins. The Hmong people I would say is a tribal people. We don't really have a country. We're more like villager, mountain people everywhere. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected. Springtime in Minnesota. The snow is gone and the lakes, woods, and fields are coming alive. This time of year, hunters turn their attention to the wild turkey. Thanks to conservation efforts of the 1970s, the population of eastern wild turkeys is now around 70,000 and they can be found in over half the state. In a ground blind near Fergus Falls, one of those turkey hunters is searching for just the right bird. I like getting them up close and, you know, for my turkey feathers, like to see that I'm getting a nice fan, so I let them come in and usually let them play around in the decoys a little bit and get a good look at the tail feathers before I take a shot. Nicole Larson is a wildlife artist in addition to being a turkey hunter, and her canvas is turkey feathers. I am very specific with the tail feathers that I want to use. Um, usually really wide and put together really nice. The color's got to be really nice and stuff. So if he doesn't have that stuff going on, he gets a pass. Nicole's ability with a paintbrush may be rivaled only by her proficiency with a bow. I practice with my bow as much as I can. With as much hunting as I do with archery equipment, um, I want to try to be as accurate as possible. I owe it to the animal. And so, you know, this spring was terrible. I didn't get out and practice a lot. And being where I'm from, it's, there's nowhere close to go and, and there's no indoor out archery ranges. So we're actually practicing in the elements, which is a good thing, but sometimes it makes it a little tough. A lot of times I'm doing more scouting than hunting and it's usually never early in the morning. I like to come out like the 10 to 2, find them strutting, find some areas that they're using, kind of pattern them a little bit, especially if it's early, like early May like it is now. My favorite time to hunt is later in May, but early in the season like this, they're pretty predictable. You can kind of find where they're feeding and roosting and then set up on them from there and that's typically what I'll do. Nicole has plenty of deer and turkeys under her belt, and the majority of them have been taken with a bow. Look at that bow hunting over the past couple years with the advanced technology and, and how bows are and crossbows and stuff like that. I think that it's become really popular with people. I don't even remember when Minnesota's first turkey season opened, but I'm willing to bet there wasn't a lot of bow hunters. And turkeys, they're tough, so you have to be pretty proficient with a bow, but I think it's gaining a lot of popularity, which is a good thing. It's great that there's more people out there finding more things to hunt, more things to do outdoors. It's great getting kids involved too. So I've taken a couple kids with a bow, and it's quite the rush for them to see something so close and try to hold it together and make that shot. 
My love for the outdoors started probably when I was, well, I was a little girl. I grew up on a farm. I was pretty lucky. Had a couple hundred acres and racehorses and farm animals everywhere. And from the moment I could walk, I think my mom said I spent as much time as I could outside. And from then, from then on, that's where my love started and grew, for sure. That's what worries me about them just creeping in on you. I don't like that at all. Tight lipped. That was a for sure gobble. I started drawing, I think I was like five or six, I remember taking out a notepad that my, my grandparents would bring over a bunch of paper. I would draw all the time, but I started sneaking out into the woods, probably five years old, and I remember seeing deer for the first time, trying to get as close to them as I could, and starting to draw them and just really getting into it, drawing everything I could see and filling up notepads. Um, and I think it, from then on, became a big passion for me. So then kind of outdoors and art came hand in hand for me. So it was a, something I've always done and always known. One key to successful turkey hunting is staying on the move to locate active birds. Wildlife art is my job, yep. I, um, I decided to do it full time after I had Chase. There was zero daycares up here or anybody that was taking him, so I kind of almost had no choice. So it was like I needed something to push me out of my comfort zone, and I ended up doing it, and it was the best choice I ever made. Nicole lives near Battle Lake with her husband Brent and their son Chase. Well, Chase, he's a busy little guy, my son. Um, he reminds me a lot of myself because he loves the outdoors. He wants to be outside any chance he can get. So. Um, he spends almost every day out with me. He even has a little longbow and he practices shooting that. But I think he's going to like hunting as much as Brent and I do. And Brent, Brent and I met um, over 10 years ago in Indy at the ATA show. And him and I both have had a love for hunting and fishing and it's, always, it's worked out great. It's nice to have somebody that has the same passions, that's for sure. While hunting can be an obsession, for Nicole, so can artwork. If there is a blank canvas in front of me, I cannot leave it blank. I have to draw on it. I have to do something with it. And that, you know, I think that's where my artwork really started to grow. I would sit there and start drawing napkins and these different people would actually pay me for them. Like I'd pay for my meals just by drawing on napkins. So people started noticing me that way. Um, and I actually started um, working with a gallery that way, just with a pen and a napkin. Combining art and the outdoors isn't new, but for Nicole, the inspiration for putting paint on a turkey feather started when a friend found a feather on the ground. She's like, could you paint on these? And from then on, I mean, I went, I, it was really bad at first. I tried painting on it and like the paint sucked into the feather and just looked like a mess. And then it took me forever to kind of figure out what worked. Um, once I finally figured that out and kind of you know, I slowly kept building off of it and learning that I needed to put lots of layers into it and spend a lot of time on it. It took me a long time to figure it out. Let's just put it that way. It wasn't easy. Nicole likes to keep moving when she turkey hunts. If the birds won't come to her, she goes to them. I do. I, <laughs> you probably could tell that from me in the blind today. I prefer to be mobile. I don't like sitting in one spot. I like to just, I like to be on the birds, I like to be after them. When they're not cooperating like they weren't today, it's kind of tough. Um, but to, to be able to move and find the birds, the birds that want to participate and can get it talking and stuff, I'll, I'll stalk them a lot more than I would sitting in a blind. Um, and it has produced results. So that's, I, I would, say that that's why I'm so successful is because I'm not afraid to be aggressive and go after the birds. I feel like that has helped me a lot. As long as you can get the decoy in the ground. As long as I can, as long as I can get the decoy in the ground before that tom comes running up to me, yes. <laughs> Want to tell us what happened? Well, one day I was <laughs> wandering, I was wandering in the grass and came around the corner and a big tom was gobbling and I couldn't figure out where he was. And I ended up coming around the corner and I had the decoy up by my head and I peeked around the corner and before I could even react, this tom was running right at me. And 
I, I had my bow in my hand, I had the decoy on an arrow, and I got down and tried to shove the decoy in the ground. I couldn't get it in the ground, and the tom came, hit the front of the decoy, knocked it into my head, <laughs> and flew over the top of me, and the hunt was over. I mean, sometimes it happens that way. <laughs> it can be pretty intense when you're hunting behind a decoy, you never know. And I can, I can hide, I know it can be dangerous, um, so I'm always well aware of who's hunting there and check out the property before I hunt it. But I've been jumped on more than once. They do come right at that decoy if you find the right bird. So I wear black, I blend in with the decoy, I hide behind it, and I've had some pretty close encounters. The closest I ever shot a turkey was he came across the front of my decoy and literally brushed across the front of my decoy and into my arrow as I let it go. Bow hunting gets you closer to the animals or birds you're hunting. It allows you to see them in their natural behaviors. But for Nicole, it also allows her a better perspective for her artwork. A couple years ago, um, Brent and I were driving around learning some new areas. We, we saw a big tom in this corner field and we actually ended up asking the guy. He said he normally hunted, but he had back surgery so he couldn't hunt this year. And he let us out to hunt. And it was one of the coolest but shortest hunts I'd ever been on. Well, I've been turkey hunting for like 10 days now and I still haven't had any luck. And I go one spot, the toms go in the other spot. So we just found a nice tom strutting not too far off the road here. And I got the old king strut ready to go. We're gonna go uh, try to decoy him in. I'm gonna hide behind the decoy and we're gonna try to shoot him. We parked the car and kind of got down into a ditch and snuck into this little corner field. There was roads, gravel roads coming down both sides and he was just kind of over the hill. So we snuck into some farm equipment and Brent sat up against it and was filming and I took the decoy and crawled over the hill because he had two hens with him and I knew if I got close enough, I'd probably make him mad. And I, I got over the hill and I was peeking and there he was and he saw me and he's in full strut, just big, beautiful bird. and he ended up coming right into me and I shot him at less than 10 steps. Well, that worked out pretty good. One of the hens started putting, so I figured it was now or never I better shoot. And um, I shot him and I kind of hit him just before his wing and it stuck out his other side. I think I hit his wing on the opposite side because there was feathers everywhere and he just hopped. He went to the edge of the woods and he sat there and he just stared. And then he just slowly kind of hop, hop, hop and went into the brush. So I just had to wait out there so I didn't spook the hens. I had a crazy recovery on this bird, but anyways, he ended up being, I'm, I'm not sure where he's at right now, but he was number one for a female with a bow. Oh my God, this is the hardest trick you've ever worked on my life. Brent was still in the swamp. He got me good with his spurs. He has huge, like inch and three quarter spur on one side and a little bit shorter on the other side. And 
Weighed about 23 pounds and had 11 inch beard. Just a big old bird. So um, I was pretty surprised when I walked up on him. I knew he was nice, but I didn't realize how nice he was. Tagged him. I'm officially tagged out in Minnesota on a giant Eastern. I like hunting just as much as I like painting, but, but it's, it's pretty equal. I enjoy just being out there and watching the animals, observing what they do. Uh, turkeys too, a lot of people don't take the time to study them and, and to learn. Like They have so many colors and different patterns on their feathers. Tail feathers, no two are alike. You know, it's, so, so for me, getting out there and just kind of learning and seeing that stuff is just as important as it is to get out there and hunt. It, 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 I don't have to kill an animal every time I go out. Sometimes just getting outside and sitting there and enjoying it is what it's all about. So if you could get to Thailand, then you could get to safety. But of course, Thailand couldn't supply, you know, space for, you know, refugees. So they, they had to create refugee camps. So that's where I was born, was the refugee camp. During the Vietnam War, the CIA funded a secret army of Hmong people to fight against North Vietnamese who were invading Laos. The Hmong paid dearly as tens of thousands were killed, including Victor Yang's father. Victor's brothers were sent to prison and he was separated from his mother when in his early teens. In 1979, Victor and other orphans were flown to the United States. Today, he lives in Brooklyn Park with his wife, Evelyn, and family. Hmong immigrants brought with them a strong connection to the outdoors. In the old country, hunting and fishing were not just recreational sports, but a means of survival. One of Victor's favorite destinations is Big Stone Lake State Park, where he fishes for white bass with his granddaughter, Adrian Lee. I've been fishing in this lake almost 10 years, and pretty much very successful. Like, we pretty much use uh, um, artificial bait, like crane bait, and uh, spinning bait, like uh, rooster tail or um, buck tail. Pretty much everything is uh, uh, artificial. Meanwhile, Victor's wife, Evelyn, chops fixings for a stuffed roasted white bass or lob a traditional Hmong dish. So we have a type of fish from Laos. It's a very similar to uh, white bass. We call it um, uh, Pachak. We call it Pachak. It's, uh, it's a Lao, Laotian language of Pachak. The same size, the taste pretty much the same too. That was the reason that we were looking for white bass. They are very similar over there. Evelyn has already roasted and chopped fish for the stuffing's base. All the uh, things that she makes in here, she already prepared, so now she puts salt. And then she makes the salt. And this is called uh, fish sauce. This is, uh, I think it's called rice, rice powder. That you can also find in an uh, Asian grocery store. She adds purple onion, lemongrass, cilantro, green onion, fresh lime juice, ginger, green beans, and mint. Now she mixed everything. She mixed all these together. So she ready to put this thing in there. You will see this one, a very, very good uh, recipe. Yeah, other uh, Hmong people, they use the same recipe. They may, some people might, might need a little bit spicy, but we are, we are too, too much Americanized, so we, we don't eat much uh, spicy anymore. So there's a without spicy. 
The stuffed fish is wrapped in banana leaf. Make, make a fragrance. Smell, smell good. <laughs> then the fish is wrapped in foil and placed on a grate over a hot fire. In 20 minutes, the delicious and healthy white bass lob is ready to delight the appetites of Victor, Adrian, and Evelyn. Chong Lor and his family are also from Laos and have lived in St. Paul since 1990. Back in Thailand and Laos, um, you know, the Vietnam War, my dad was a uh, part of, you know, he was a soldier, so he was part of the war, and Thailand was the only neutral country. And so during the war, a lot of families had to flee, you know, in order to get their loved ones to safety. So if you could get to Thailand, then you could get to safety. But of course, Thailand couldn't supply, you know, space for, you know, refugees. So they, they had to create refugee camps. So that's where I was born was the refugee camp. The Hmong people, I would say, is a tribal people. We don't really have a country. We're more like villager, mountain people. We kind of live everywhere, you know, China, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, all over the place. Being outdoors is in Chong's genes, and he loves to fish for walleye, crappies, and white bass. But he had never been on a goose hunt, until he went out with Brett Amundsen last fall. You know, more of a fisherman than I am a hunter, but trying to convert because a lot of relatives are hunter. They're trying to, you know, have me become a hunter too. It is a tradition because instead of going out to buy, you know, meat or fish or whatever it is, you know, you can actually go out and fish for it or hunt for it. In our culture, you know, the food, you know, the cooking and stuff that we do, we usually use, you know, out of every animal, we usually use almost all the parts, meaning bones, intestines. Out of one animal, so let's say a goose, right? We can actually turn that into a couple of different dish. So, you know, we would take debone, use the bone for stock, and then use the meat as a stir fry. But beyond putting food on the table, Chong enjoys the camaraderie of outdoor sports. When you talk to somebody, you know, regarding hunting, fishing, you know, you share a common interest, you know, you create like a source of, like a sense of, uh, you know, communication and a bond between another person. We're out here doing what other people are out here to do too. You know, we wanted to have fun, you want to have fun. We're out here relaxing and just having a blast doing what we like to do. Watch out for the aqua invaders. These innocent looking plants and fish might be handsome and flashy, but they're choking habitats in the land of sky blue waters. Whether we invited them here or they hitchhiked in, we're out to identify these aquatic invasive species and stop their spread.
This segment was brought to you by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Candy, Ohio, Big Stone, and Yellow Medicine Counties. Have a question for Prairie Sportsman? Contact us at prairiesportsman at pioneer.org or hashtag AskPS on Facebook and Twitter. For more on Prairie Sportsman and to view episodes online, go to prairiesportsman.org. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to get outdoors this week. was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. And by Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, quietly beautiful and wildly connected.